Hey everyone, my name is Paul, and I'll be talking about contract-based accounts, and in particular, uh, what they mean for mobile dApps, UX, censorship, and developer experience. Uh, I am Paul Cowgill on Twitter. Feel free to check, out, check me out there. And I'm the founder and tech lead of a project called Tacit, uh, where our focus is native mobile Ethereum dApps. A couple of assumptions and premises for this talk are that UX is very important and it should drive all downstream decisions. Uh, in particular, uh, you want to consider who the user is. So I'm talking here about uh, the early majority in an adoption cycle. Um, and often, as we saw in the last talk, there isn't really, there doesn't need to be a trade off between UX and decentralization. So that's another underlying premise here. So, what are we talking about today? Contract based accounts. Uh, for a quick definition, the the idea is basically that you have a contract holding funds or sending transactions rather than a vanilla Ethereum account. Uh, and the state of the art for this space, uh, this is being used in smart wallets. Obviously, uh, Gnosis is putting on this conference. They have the Gnosis safe. Also, Argent is a great uh, smart wallet. Uh, there are a couple dApps that have tried this as well. Uh, in particular, Dharma and Instadapp, I know have uh, this abstraction between the user's account and the dApp. And there are starting to be some SDKs as well. In particular, I should give a shout out to Universal Logins. A lot of this is inspired by Alex Van Sands talks about that. Um, there's also um, some cool SDKs, Abridged and Authorium that you should check out. Uh, but our focus for today will be on what this means for dApps. Uh, and why is this interesting? Well, uh, it offers all the same great benefits that you get for smart wallets. So, uh, if the contract is holding the funds, you're able to do account recovery. You basically just swap out to a new key that, can, uh, that has control over the funds in that contract, which means that the user doesn't have to be presented with seed phrases, uh, which is a huge UX win. I know we're probably losing 99.9% .9 of mainstream folks because of that. Uh, and it also means that users don't have to worry about OPSEC. I know, for instance, the first time I was trying CryptoKitties, I paused for a good 15 minutes and thought about so do I need multiple accounts? Like, how does this map to what I do with like my work and personal email? Am I worried about like doing DeFi things with my game account? Uh, so taking this approach kind of removes that question for the user and taking this more opinionated contract-based account approach um, makes it a lot simpler. But it's still fully self-custodial. So as I said, there's not a trade-off here be between UX and decentralization. And then you also get the other great UX wins that you get with Argent and Gnosis Safe, like batch transactions, multi-factor auth for transactions, and fine-grained fine -grained controls like daily limits, or whitelisting particular contracts for using your funds, or particular addresses to send your funds to. But what does this mean for dApps? Um, well, that it's all the, we get all these benefits, but not just for smart wallets. You can get these benefits like recovery, but for um, a dApp. And in particular, it means that if you have a given interface, let's say there's a native mobile dApp that you've downloaded, but then Apple decides to remove the app from the App Store. If you had your funds with a vanilla Ethereum account that was an in-app key, you'd have essentially no recourse. You wouldn't be able to continue using those funds. But if it's in a contract-based account, uh, the problem becomes as simple as swapping out the primary uh, key that you use to control those funds. Uh, so that means that native mobile, like the, essentially the main argument against native mobile dApps goes away, uh, which is great because, again, the focus here is on UX for mainstream users, and that's kind of the de facto flow today. People usually are on mobile, and they're used to downloading things from the App Store. Um, so it's kind of, my prediction that we can 100x or 1,000x the number of users if we tend to follow the standard ways that users do things right now. Um, and there was a great talk from Cello yesterday, but really, I mean, if you think of any young person or any person in the world that's not us, they mostly aren't using their laptops, may not even have laptops, uh, but there are more and more people with smartphones. Uh, so, and even today, so we, we need to be embracing that reality. Um, I also think that if you s zoom out two years from now, the way Ethereum will really take off is most likely from a particular dApp that finally nails the UX and delivers a lot of user value. Um, and in that case, you might have, let's say, some scalability issues aside, you end up with a million users. 
At that time, maybe hopefully there's 100,000 users with wallets. So building an experience that requires that they go through a wallet setup flow or pre-assumes that they already have a wallet set up is pretty backwards and it's gonna limit the virality of that dApp. So embedding uh, a flow for contract-based accounts into the dApp onboarding flow um, keeps that viral coefficient high and can actually make this stuff go mainstream. Um, which, which brings me to a small gripe I have even about the word wallets. Like, if you have an app right now in Web2 that's using the Stripe API, just because it involves financial transactions doesn't mean that there's a special name for that class of app. And yet we have this abstraction in Ethereum where certain things are wallets and other things are dApps. Um, I picture this blending over time where wallets become more ubiquitous and pieces of dApps that can or cannot interlink with proper wallets. And what that means is that wallets don't need to be a part of the interface and certainly not the entire interface. In the case of mobile web, um, mobile wallets with uh, Web3 browsers, they're the entire interface. Uh, that UX is weird for a user because you have to say first download this, then you can use the app that you actually care about. Um, and even in the case where you're kicking the user regularly over to a wallet to approve transactions, uh, as if, if you're a team that really values design and wants to make a truly viral dApp, that can kill the feel of the flow, which really does matter to users. If it, if it feels awkward, they're not gonna tell their friends to download it. Um, so moving the wallet into the dApp can uh, be a new pattern that I think more and more people should look into. Uh, I know wallets certainly will continue to be a very important thing, but I, the way I map it to my Web2 understanding is that they're more like a savings or investment account. Um, I basically just want my ETH or maybe my CDI to be as secure as possible, and then I pretty much don't wanna ever touch it, kind of like I do with my regular savings or investment accounts. Um, it's still nice if you can interlink seamlessly, like if you wanna move funds from your savings to your checking account and then use that to pay for credit card payments. I think we'll start to see something similar in the dApp world where you can still seamlessly move funds between them or approve uh, usage of funds, but there's no reason to mash all the UXs together. Uh, if every time I was doing a credit card transaction, I was kicked over to like my Bank of America mobile app, I, that, that would, you can just picture how gross of an experience that would be. Um, so what I see happening is that uh, contract-based accounts will become ubiquitous. Um, and a hat tip here to Austin Griffith. This is partially inspired by the notion of burner wallets. This is kind of like burner smart wallets or burner contract-based accounts. Where's the time? Okay. Um, so how do we make this happen? We want a smart wallet within every dApp. Uh, so one way to do this, and the way we're doing this uh, with the Tacit project through our uh, Gecko program funding, is the DAP deploys a new safe contract that's not the safe contract that was deployed by the Gnosis Safe iOS or Android app, uh, but rather by a DAP that's an entirely separate dedicated safe contract. Uh, and there are a few ways you can do this, but probably the simplest one to consider is that there's an in-app key, an in-DAP key on the device that's specific to that DAP and that device. And then the recovery key, at, at least for like uh, power Ethereum users, can be your main Gnosis safe. Um, so if you ever switch phones, you can always uh, swap that out. Uh, but you know, I mentioned ubiquitous contract-based accounts. We don't want to be flooding the Ethereum network. We only want to be doing this for users that uh, have, have used the DAP enough that it warrants actually deploying the contract. So you can do the standard create two magic and uh, have the, like, let's say you give a user an NFT for signing up, they can have a contract address that has permissions to have that NFT, but there's no actual contract yet. Um, and the way I picture this UX flow going is with rare or batched topping up of the account. I mentioned the savings and investment account thing versus your checking account or your Venmo. Um, so there's still a linkage with the Gnosis safe and there should be a flow perhaps through deep linking for moving funds from the Gnosis safe to the uh, contract-based account for the dApp. But that UX should be very infrequent. And you can also leverage batch transactions to do clever things like uh, doing one of these transfers only on demand when you're actually gonna do something of high value in the dApp, like purchase a parcel of Decentraland land. 
Um, so so there have been some great blog posts about progressive decentralization. Uh, I don't want to compromise on decentralization, but I think uh, maybe an alternate way to think of this is progressive security. So if a user downloaded an app, never came back to it, they had an NFT that nobody cares about, it's kind of fine that they don't have a seed phrase backed up. It's also fine that there's not any multi-factor auth on that. It's even fine if the contract that owns that NFT was never actually deployed. Um, but then if you move along this spectrum, you can have for the DAP a contract-based account with a, a mobile wallet linked, and then it's one of two signing, or you can do the same things you would do with smart wallets. Like you might, j just for that really important DAP, add social recovery, perhaps leveraging the same social recovery you used in Argent or something like that, um, or hook up a ledger wallet as your recovery key. And then finally, if you're really, like let's say you're holding a lot of ERC-20 tokens or a lot of ERC-721 tokens, you can always sweep those to a proper wallet. And the dApp should not aim to be more secure than that, but it should have a nice flow for moving things in that direction uh, when it's appropriate. Uh, the approach we're using here is many simple instances of a Gnosis safe rather than trying to really decorate one singleton Gnosis safe. And that's because it becomes really hard to reason about like under what scenarios the four of seven signing would be right and the daily limit would be right for the CryptoKitties app as opposed to your DeFi app. Uh, having them each separately configured allows for a better DevX and it's just simpler to reason about. Uh, speaking of DevX, I think we do need more SDKs that facilitate this approach. Uh, again, Abridged and Authorium and Universal Logins are doing some interesting work in this direction. Um, I do think by having a more opinionated uh, stance on how the dApp should work, it means that it's a little harder for existing dApps to port their approach over to this approach. But if you're really trying to make a viral mainstream dApp, it's not so bad to kind of rethink the entire way you do onboarding with a, a more mobile-first approach. Uh, Threebox is a really awesome tool for linking your existing social profiles, et cetera, with a particular address. Uh, doing things this way makes their lives a little more challenging, but not prohibitively challenging. So you can always uh, select which of your many contract-based accounts it makes sense to link with a particular social profile. Uh, how I see this playing out is kind of like with Slack. Today, it feels ridiculous in Slack. You're probably in, all in 20 workspaces. But if you rewind three or five years, you were probably only in one workspace, and that felt great. Uh, and that can feel like a mistake in retrospect, but I think it was actually the right thing for Slack to do because everyone was only in one workspace three to five years ago. And they can now begin to rethink the UI and start linking between workspaces and simplifying that UX. Uh, but it would have been a mistake to assume people would have been in multiple workspaces a long time ago, and I think it'd be easy to fall into that trap for dApps too. Realistically, a mainstream user probably only cares about one dApp, and that'll be true for the next four years. So you wanna optimize the experience around making that one dApp great. But over time, uh, you can imagine that a particular contract-based account for a dApp would be shared between all of your different game apps or all of your different uh, investment account-like apps and so on. Um, and over time, I see this, uh, your identity is kind of defined by the apps you use and the groups you belong to. Hats up to Glenn Weil for this concept. Um, I think it relates to the OPSEC point. This is a much better way to naturally kind of annotate your many different presences on the web by having the different contract-based accounts separated. So this all enables native mobile dApps. We're working on this with the Tacit project. Um, here is a, a flow where you start by seeing the value in a dApp and only later are uh, prompted to set up an account. Um, again, this is all uh, graciously funded through the Gecko program, which I highly recommend. Here are some of our social links, Twitter, Discord, Telegram, GitHub, Medium. Um, and again, a quick plug for Gecko. They really have helped so much with outreach funding and support, so uh, that's can't recommend it highly enough. Um, and I think I'm out of time, so yeah, one or two questions. You have counterfactual contracts that is insecure on that spectrum. Why is that? Oh, the, the approach is plenty secure. Um, if the user is at a stage where... Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just saying um, there's no reason to have yet deployed it. 
Yeah, that's an interesting subtlety. I, I wouldn't really call it insecure. It's just in the sequence of events, you don't deploy it until the user has enough funds that it's worth deploying it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paul.